I'd like to read some scripture to you today. It's from the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, starting at verse 19. It says, I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but in the world to come. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and made him the head over all things for the benefit of the church, us, and The church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ, who fills all things everywhere with himself. I think that's worthy of praise. His spirit's present here this morning. We always say this. He inhabits our praises. So let's keep praising him and he'll be here with us. Let's keep worshiping God. Amen.
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Oh, praise your name, God. Thank you, Lord, for paying a debt we couldn't know, we couldn't pay. Thank you, Lord, for shedding your blood. Thank you, Lord, for loving sinners such as us. And I thank you, Lord, that now you've made us your children. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'm reading out of 1 John 4, verse 9. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we loved God but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. And I want you to know that not only was sin paid for in the atonement, but healing and freedom was paid for in the atonement. When Jesus sacrificed his life, salvation means complete, lacking nothing. And some of us have stepped into salvation and we need to take that next step and step into the completeness that God wants for us. The complete victory over sin, death, hell, and the grave, over sickness and disease, over bondage and, and addiction. God wants us, us to be complete, whole, a complete salvation in your life to take place. Praise the Lord. As we go to prayer today, you might not need anything, but you might have unsaved loved ones. Would you raise your hands and pray for them as we go to prayer? If you need a, a, a healing in your body, would you raise your hands as we go to prayer? If you need God to do a miracle in your finances, would you raise your hands as we go to prayer? If you need freedom from addiction or bondage or any sin that's been so easily besetting you, would you raise your hands as we go to prayer? And let's believe God that the Holy Spirit is going to do a work in every heart, in every life. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we thank you because of the blood of Jesus. Because you've made us your children, we can boldly enter into the throne room of grace and we can boldly present our needs and our, our, our wants to you, God. And you are ready to hear and to answer prayer. God, we thank you, Lord, that you shed your blood. And that we have become your children by receiving that grace and forgiveness. And God, I pray, Lord, this morning, Father God, for new life to be surged into every one of us, God. New hope, new encouragement, new, new victory, God, over sin, death, hell, and the grave. God, I thank you, Lord, that as we become your children, resurrection power lives in us, God. And I pray, Father God, that, that you said that that same power that raised Christ from the dead would dwell in us, God. It would quicken our mortal bodies. I pray, Lord, that you'd quicken some bodies today, God. I pray, Father God, that new life would be where, where, where there was infection. I pray, Father God, against disease and sickness right now in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, that we have victory through your word, through your blood. We stand in that victory today. And we say, be healed in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. God, I thank you, Father God, that everything we need is found in you. And we stand on your word, God. And Father God, unsaved loved ones, financial miracles, freedom from sin. I thank you, Lord, that we stand in that victory today. We stand on your promise. 
And we say it's done in the name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the name above every name. No other thing can stand against the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 I thank you, Lord, that he who the Son sets free is free indeed. Thank you, Lord. Help us to walk in that freedom today, God. Help us to walk in that new life. And let this day, Father God, be the start of something new. And help us to never be the same again. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen and amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> praise the Lord. Glory to God. Can we say praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. God is so good. And all the time, God is good. Amen. Welcome to New Beginnings. We're so glad you decided to come today. If it's your first time, there's a visitor's card in the seat in front of you. We ask you to fill that out and either drop it in our offering or you can hand it to Pastor Ben and myself. Um, would, we, would you just take a few minutes and greet two or three people around you and say, I'm so glad you came today.
Amen. Who's got something to sing about because Jesus is alive and working in your life? Amen. All right. Did everybody get their palms this morning? <laughs> Who was supposed to hand those out? See, some of you get it. You got them. God gave them to you. You woke up with them. So raise your hands and let's praise God. God, we thank you, God. God, we thank you, God, for a risen Savior. God, we thank you, God, that, Lord, what we're celebrating, God, is, is your triumphal entry, God, into Jerusalem, God. And, God, we celebrate that because, God, what that meant was the start of something powerful was going to happen, God. You came in that day, God, because you were coming in, Lord God, to settle a score that needed to be settled for centuries. And, God, by the time that week was over, that thing was settled. That debt was paid, Father. And God, I thank you that every day, God, we can raise our hands and say, our Savior lives, Jesus is alive, the devil is defeated, and victory is ours. Amen. Amen. He is alive. I'm telling you, listen, I, I, I like things like Christmas, I like Easter and all that kind of stuff, but we've got to remember that they're just reminders of something that is settled and done and passed, and he is risen and alive every single day. This will never be a church where once a year we put Jesus back on a cross on a Friday. He's not on that cross anymore. He's not in that tomb anymore. He is risen and he is alive. Amen. 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 A couple of reminders of things that are happening here at New Beginning Church. Lots of things that are happening. Uh, first of all, if you are going to youth convention, I need to see you after service. Meet me in the front here. Just want to give a little bit of instruction for that. Um, again, great group that we have going. Excited about what God has in store for that. Um, also, ladies and men, there's a couple of district conferences that are coming up in April. And we have information in the lobby about those. And reminder, those are going to take the place of our regular April meetings for the men's and the ladies. So ladies, there'll be no regular Friday night meeting in April because they're going to, we're doing the conference. Men, there's not going to be a men's breakfast because that day we'll be going to the men's conference in Ben Salem. So please, information out there in the lobby about that. Um, also want to let you know that there is not going to be a separate missions offering anymore at New Beginnings Church. What? <laughs> because today we are going to establish faith promises. And each of us is going to be asked later on in the service to, to, to commit what we believe God is going to do through us in the area of missions in this coming year. And so what we're going to do is you can give for missions at any offering as God works through you and blesses you with this faith promise that you're going to, we're going to talk about later. And all you have to do is mark missions. We're not going to have a special offering anymore. We're just going to drop it in any offering. It's going to make life easier for you. It's going to make life easier for us. And you know what? We're going to be meeting the needs of our missionaries. And I'm excited that this year we're going to be adding missionaries. Amen. We're going to be adding missionaries. That wall is going to fill up little by little by little out there. We're going to be adding missionaries. Amen. Up here at the front, there's a box here. I put that there just so you have a visual. Next week, when you bring your resurrection offering, all right? Everybody got one of these? If you didn't get one, we have a few left out there. And next Sunday is Resurrection Sunday, where we celebrate the resurrection of our Savior. And we're also asking everyone to just bring a special offering to say, Thank you, Jesus, that you're alive. Thank you, Jesus, that I go to a church that's alive. Thank you, Jesus, that we're ready to settle the things of the past to move forward for what you have in the future. And so we're asking you to take that envelope, eat the fish. Remember, the fish are just a reminder. Nothing spiritual there, okay? Don't take the fish. If you have a fever, don't take the fish and lay it on your forehead and say, oh, this fish, they're special. Fi no, they're just Swedish fish. They're just a reminder to us that God does miracles. When people partner with God, a little boy and his lunch, a disciple fishing and, and catching a fish that has the taxes in its mouth, a group of fishermen dropping their nets on the other side of the boat. Why one side matters over the other, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense, but it's about obedience to God. And God does miracles. So enjoy the fish. Bring your offering next week. And because this is about us, not about our guests, not about our visitors that I believe are going to be with us next week. So what we're going to do is we're not going to have a special offering for this next week. This box is going to be right up here. And next week, when we, when we greet one another, what we're going to ask you to do is if you have a, an offering that you're bringing as part of this resurrection offering on Easter Sunday, during the time of greeting, just take a little se a second, come on up here, drop it in the box, and then that'll be, that's our special offering as the people, the family of New Beginnings. 
And so we want to encourage you to do that and be a part of that. Um, tonight is our missions banquet starting at 5 o'clock. Okay, I hope you're planning. I hope you're coming. If you weren't and you didn't think about it, plan on it and come. 5 o'clock, Women's Teen Challenge. Oh, his powerful testimonies of what God is doing and what God is at, at, where God is at work. On top of that, great food. Ooh, where are we catering from, Pastor? Your kitchen. <laughs> the catering is direct from your kitchen. It's you and me and all of us just bringing something to share, something that you made. I, again, if you, well, I don't cook, Pastor. Then buy it. I don't care. Just show up. Let's fellowship together. Let's hear about what God is doing in the lives of these women from Teen Challenge. So that's tonight at 5 o'clock. And then last but not least, next Sunday, as I said, is Easter. We've been handing these out. We've been saying, take these and hand them out. We started with 500 of these. We are under 200 left. So 300 plus of these have gone out. And so as you go out into the lobby, on the table out there, there's little bundles of these, bundles of five. And what we're saying is we're calling it our Easter week take five challenge. Take five of these, take five minutes this week, invite five people. That's it. Five minutes, five invitations, five people. I want to see all of those that are out there gone when you guys leave today. So that we are at least doing our part to get the message out. And then we're going to pray this week that God's going to do his part and the people are going to come in. Amen? Amen. Amen. God is good. It's time to worship God through our giving. So if our ushers are ready, I'm going to ask them to, to get their stuff, get, get ready back there. I appreciate everyone in this church that serves in big and small ways. And, and this is one of those ways. So they're ready. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your presence. We thank you, God, again, that, that you are here in full, in, in full glory and in full power this morning, God. I thank you, God, that there's already work being done in the lives and the hearts of people, God, because, God, we've connected with you already, Father. We've prayed. We put our faith in what your word says, and we're believing for answers, God. And Lord, I pray that as we, we worship God through our giving, God, as we bring the tithe, 10%, it's yours, right off the top. We give it to you. It declares our trust is in you, God. And also we bring the offering, God. Lord, use it for, the, for your glory, God. But more importantly, God, let us learn through our giving, through our giving, that we are yours and we are taken care of. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you as you give.
Amen. What a, what a simple phrase, but what a powerful phrase. Jesus, you have overcome the world. And church, I am thankful that because of the empty tomb, we can sing that with confidence. He has overcome the world. Amen? Amen. Let's put your hands together. Let's praise God just one more time. God, thank you for that. Thank you for that, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to let our kids go. Head down to Kids Church with Pastor Christy. I you know they got some good stuff going down there. They're doing a bug's life or bug something, something with bugs. And some of you are like, I don't like bugs. But last week they talked about the praying mantis. And they talked about the power of prayer. And you know what? I am thankful that, that, that our kids have a place to go to learn about God's word. And look, they can, they can stay here and hear about God's word, but you know what? There's something about having it in their own way, their own language, their own style. They're having a great time down there. Anyway, I am excited about today. Today wraps up. Amen. Well, good. You guys are excited, too. Today wraps up a month where we've been highlighting what God is doing around the world. And we started off our month. We had, we had Men's Teen Challenge here, and, and they, they ministered. And we, and what God, that's, that's kind of what God's doing locally. And then last week, uh, then the week after that, we had the, the Rain student ministry team from Evangel University here, and they ministered to us. And, and, and that's what God is doing, you know what, through the lives of our young people. God's at work in the lives of our young people. And I want to tell you, we got to keep praying for them, encouraging them, and, and reaching out to them. You know, last week, you got me. And we talked about what God wants to do through us as we pray, as we praise, as we proclaim the gospel. And this week, I'm excited to have our, our, our guest today, Dwayne Danielson. Dwayne has just been a part of just so many different ministries and, 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 and impacting lives in so many different ways that, you know what, I would do a disservice to try to, to, to talk about that. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to invite our, our guest today, Dwayne Danielson, to come on up and, and just share with us what God has laid upon his heart. Now, the one thing I do love about Dwayne is he's a, he's a fellow Yankees fan. It's a, it's a tough crowd. Yes. But they'll still love you. Yes. So, thank you. Let's give it one more time. Let's welcome Dwayne to our yeah. culture. Thank you. The... Uh, my wife is even more of a rabid Yankees fan. She watches, because, you know, we're 12 hours ahead. So she watches the games in the middle of the night. And uh, just went to spring training with my son, who's a Messiah College uh, student, sophomore year. And we got to go to a couple games. And then uh, I have another son, Jared, who's uh, in 10th grade. And they're both overseas. I actually head back tomorrow. Um, so this is my last stop before heading back. And... Um, Without further ado, I'm just going to play a video with my wife and kind of give you an overview of what we've been involved with. We're the area directors for Southern Asia. So 20 years ago, we began our ministry in Bangladesh. Quickly, we realized there's a lot of need spread out throughout the country. God was just narrowing our focus to those that are in extreme poverty. And so what we found ourselves in Dhaka, Bangladesh, is opening a street kids center called Utom's Place. And that place was for girls that were born in, you know, they were born into slum, they were born into poverty. And we felt like God was calling us to a few to take them on a, a 10 year journey from life in the slums to college graduates. Now we're just a few years into it to see their lives holistically transformed. For them to have access to the gospel and the transforming power of God, it, it took us to say, hey, we're going to have a long term commitment to these girls. So just about nine years ago, we were asked, Lori and I, to serve as area directors for the countries that are around India. What we felt God doing was just kind of expanding our heart. We had a heart for Bangladesh, but then we realized there's, there's these countries that lack access to the gospel. We have five countries, uh, three major religions. Nothing really unifies us, but there's one thing that does bring us together and that is we're all working to bring access. We've seen obstacles overcome, but we, we're starting to see them overcome at a, a bigger pace. We have developed this focus on teams. So instead of us going alone to these difficult places, we're gonna go together and use uh, the giftings and talents of everyone in the group, but we're gonna be very intentional to go to the regions beyond in Southern Asia. So we wanna say thank you. Um, 20 years ago, we were just 25 years old leaving for the field uh, with a nine-month-old in our arms and 
I just want to say thank you for your faithfulness um, and standing behind us. It was kind of risky <laughs> to support us back then. We were just these young kids, but we just really appreciate your faithfulness, forgiving, and praying for us and your encouragement. It has really sustained our family through these 20 years. And as we look to the next 20 years, mm -hmm. we look with great anticipation. And now more than ever, we need you to, to continue your partnership with us. And we need you to pray. And then we're asking you to come. There's a place for you, whether you're a business person, whether you're a professional, whether you're a pastor, a youth pastor, there, there's a place for you in Southern Asia. And it's we're gonna all work together to bring access to the gospel. So to find out more, check out our websites and contact us on email and Facebook. And we look forward to connecting with you and seeing what God's gonna do through you to impact Southern Asia. So as I share, thank you. So as we sh I shared, we serve in the countries that ring around the nation of India, and uh, we have our logo that will be coming up. And you can see the uh, the instead of the teeth of the key, there's different uh, uh, symbols there, and they represent the different countries. So on the left, that's the the tiger's nest in Bhutan. Uh, tiger's nest is a temple that's up on a mountain. You go to about seven thousand feet, park your car, and then draw, then walk. 3,000 feet more to get up to it. I went there back in September, and uh, I was like, you know, about 15 minutes into it. When you're really overweight, you're like, oh, I'm not going to be able to make it. But then I saw a person bigger than me ahead of me in flip-flops, and I'm like, if she can make it, I can make it. You know? <laughs> and uh, so I made it to the top. But that's to represent that Bhutan. The next one is the stupa in Kathmandu. Pa Pastor has been to, uh, to Nepal, and that represents Nepal. And then the next, middle one is Bangladesh, where we spent 14 years, um, and that's the Language Martyrs uh, Memorial. They fought an entire war just to keep their language, Bengali, as their national language, and won their independence back in the early 70s. And so that's a very important monument for them. And then there is Sri Lanka, the a big, huge Buddhist statue in Sri Lanka, and then the Grand Friday Mosque in the, the island of the Maldives. And so those are the countries that we're engaged in, but they're all about bringing access. You know, you know, America is one of the largest lost countries in the world, but they have access to the gospel. There's churches everywhere. Turn on the radio, all kinds of things this morning on TV, and people have access, but there are people in the world that don't have access, and so we're working to bring access to the gospel Difficult terrains. We have people in the mountains of the Himalayas trekking out there to bring the gospel. And then you have countries that are 90% water. Uh, then you look at the different uh, political barriers and different obstacles. It seems sometimes impossible, but God is moving, and we've been excited to be a part of that. Uh, one of the things that we started, we shared about Utom's Place, uh, this girls' center for 19 girls that we've been bringing on this journey over the last several years. It's been exciting to see their lives transformed. Um, this, uh, back in 2015, the girls of the Assemblies of God raised money uh, to buy a permanent facility. And so we'll be, build, we'll be uh, uh, renovating a building and getting that ready this year for that. And uh, so we're gonna just give you a glimpse into that world of that, just that one project of many, but all of them, whether it's earthquake relief, whether it's Bible school, uh, development, all these things are all about bringing access. And so let's go ahead and just show this kind of glimpse into the world of Utah's Place. What's your big dream? When you grow up, do you want to be a doctor, a policewoman, a singer? Whatever your dream, it's probably big. And in order to get there, we go to school. Even though you may not like doing homework, waking up early, or riding the school bus, our education gives us what we need to make our big dreams come true. But what if your school didn't prepare you for your big dream? And in the country of Bangladesh, that's how it is for a lot of girls. They don't always learn everything they need to make their big dreams come true. But we can help them become the best young women they can be. Each year, girls like us make a difference by giving to Coins for Kids. Coins for Kids makes the lives of girls like you and me better all around the world. This year, we're going to help an after-school program in Bangladesh called Utong's Place. So what's Utong's Place like? Let's go see. Girls can go to Utong's Place before or after school to get the tools they need to journey from life in the slums to a much better life as college graduates. At Utong's Place, 
girls can get an edge on their education so they can provide help for their families, live out their dreams, and fulfill God's big dream for their lives in ways they never could have without help. Girls have the chance to get a good meal that they can share with each other while growing closer to the people around them. Fun and educational activities help girls develop skills like writing, speaking English, expressing themselves through art and dance, and interacting with other kids. We've got to talk to Tangila, a student at Utom's Place, about how the program is impacting her life. After school, I come to Utom's Place, and it usually takes an hour to get here. When I come to Utom's Place, I learn many things. I learn the computer and how to type. I also learn how to speak English, dance, and sing. Utom's Place gave me the chance to know Jesus, and he's my personal savior. I'm so thankful for that. The girls and I from Utom's Place would like to say thank you for helping us live out our dream. Pretty neat, huh? Sometimes we forget that not everyone has the great opportunities that we do. But when we give our coins, we help girls who need opportunities get them. Giving can be scary. After all, that's our allowance. But remember, everything we have, our phones, computers, clothes, shoes, homes, and money, is not really ours. It's God's. Jesus said, be generous. Give to the poor. Get yourselves a bank that can go bankrupt. A bank in heaven far from bank robbers. A bank you can bank on. This is our chance to be generous and to help make the dreams of girls all around the world come true. And all it takes is some coins. We thank you! So the girls in America raised over $150,000 through that. So it's pretty cool. And uh, some of the girls want to become nurses, doctors, different, you know, different things, and teachers. And the one that's interviewed there, she wants to be a movie star. That's her. So she's already starting out. She's on a video. Um, but uh, well, it's been a, a blessing to see the lives of these girls transform. And, uh, and in the back, we have a table, and we have a mug that is available to, to purchase that helps our street kids center and has two designs that were designed by two of the girls. We also have butterfly earrings that are made of butterfly wings because our theme is the butterfly, and so you can check that out and all the proceeds, and it'll give you a prayer reminder uh, to pray for those girls. We also have a brochure in the back that outlines the different countries and how you can be effectively pray and also look to see, hey, what are the opportunities there for me to serve? Uh, and as we share in the sermon today, you might be surprised at what kind of people we're looking for to serve, and you might be the pe person that God uh, is calling to go to our part of the world. So let's pray. Lord. Thank you for being able to be here on this uh, Missions Emphasis Month. Uh, Lord, you are at work, whether it's in the lives of people who have uh, been captured and, and in chains of drug addiction, or whether it's young people that you're stirring to be world changers, whether it's just right across the street, uh, people that are ready to give their last spiritual breath, and you have strategically placed us in their neighborhoods and in their lives and in their workplaces and then on the other side of the world, as we might never visit, but as we invest in your kingdom, uh, we start to see history change. And the history books of girls like the girls at Utom's Place or people in the mountains of the Himalayas or the oceans, uh, the islands in the Indian Ocean, we see those lives transform as we invest. Lord, today, as we share, as I share, Lord, help us, Lord, not to just see what you're doing on the other side of the world, but what what part you want us to play in that. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Again, thanks for having me with you. Uh, this morning, I want to talk to you about how God is orchestrating history. We're going to be looking in a moment uh, at the time when Jesus went to the cross, which we'll be talking about next week, obviously, as that fits the calendar. But when you think about an orchestra, what are the different elements of an orchestra? You have... Uh, the conductor, he's usually like at a podium like this. He might have a baton like this. And then there's different sections. There's the woodwind section, the percussion, the what is it, brass. All, you know. So you got all these sections. And then they're strategically placed, aren't they? Like you don't put the percussion up front. 
Everyone is there, and they're usually set up the chairs like this where they're all looking to the conductor. And then there's an important thing. You need to have an audience, someone to hear what you're playing. There is a score, you know, that everyone is following. Otherwise, we sound like an elementary school band. You know, we're all supposed to be following the same piece of, of music. And then it's all about timing. It's about being in tune. It's using the instrument you have. My brother-in-law, who's in a... He's, he's a musician, and he uh, says that sometimes he's in an orchestra, and he'll wait 100 measures just to play two notes. So it comes to that point, and he's like, okay, and it's those two notes. But, you know, it seems insignificant, but it's crucial to the whole presentation, to the whole piece. And uh, when you get into music, and I'm not really musical, but there's this crescendo that happens, right, that gradual increase in volume. For those of you who are not music, it's like when Star Wars starts. You know, you start to feel this anticipation. Something's going to happen. There's going to be a climax that comes, and the climax is the point of greatest intensity or force, and an ascending series or progression, a culmination in this piece. Something is about to happen. And I believe that God is orchestrating history, and he has been throughout history. And we are his instruments. He's the conductor, and some of us, we're waiting for our time for us to play our notes because God has strategically placed us. Think about time. God has been about time. It says in Galatians 4, 4, it says, but when the set time had come, Jesus, uh, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. So they're up in heaven, and they're like, okay, now's the time. Jesus is going to come to earth. And we are part of his redemptive symphony. God has something for you and I to do this morning. So this is not about, oh, what do our workers do overseas? It's, it's about what part do we play in his symphony? Because each of us have been strategically placed in his work. He, you know, sometimes we think it's by accident we're somewhere. It's not. God has strategically placed us, and we each have an instrument and if we don't play our instrument, it's not like someone else fills our spot. And so that's what I want to talk to you today. So we're going to be looking at Luke 23 through 32 through 43. It will be up on the screen. This is the account of when Jesus went to be crucified. And so Luke 23, 32 through 43. Two other men, both criminals, were led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. And then they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers sneered at him. They said, He saved others. Let him save himself if he's God's Messiah, the chosen one. And then the soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you're king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since we're under the same sentence? We are ju punished justly. We're getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered, Truly, I tell you today, you're going to be with me in paradise. And so we notice in this story, the first thing we notice is that God is orchestrating history for his redemptive opportunity. Now, it didn't seem like that was what was going on. You know, if we had had CNN and Fox News back then and they interviewed the disciples or the people close to Jesus and said, hey, what's going on today? Everything going good? They would have been like, no, no. You know, we, you know, here's Jesus in verse 32 being brought out before with two criminals. You know, a week before on Palm Sunday, they probably thought he's going to be brought out in front of royalty and important people. And yet, here we see him getting brought out between two criminals to be executed. Then he's humiliated as they divide up his clothes and cast lots in verse 34. And then all kinds of people are around him, whether it's the thief on the cross, the, the, uh, the, People that are watching, the, the guards, they're all making fun of him and mocking him. And then verse 38, it says, you know, written notice above him, which read, this is the king of the Jews. That was probably like the first Facebook post. 
You know, the idea like, hey, let's make a point. Let's put that up there and kind of make fun of him. And so it seemed at that moment, we know what happened later, but at that moment, it, it probably seemed like everything is going wrong. But we know on this side of history that God was orchestrating history for his redemptive opportunity. And when we look at the political landscapes of our world, if we just turn on the news today, if we look at the economic outlooks, if we look at the governments, the situations in our workplaces, in our families, the streets of Bangladesh, or the islands of the Indian Ocean, it's sometimes hard to realize God is orchestrating history for his redemptive opportunity. We are looking at the situations at work and that person who makes fun of us for being a Christian and that family member who's so far from God and that country that seems impenetrable to the gospel. But we have to go back to God is orchestrating history for his redemptive opportunity, even when it doesn't look like it. Every year in Bangladesh, two-thirds of the country floods. So two-thirds is underwater, and that doesn't even make the news. And, uh, and then when the waters start to go down, all the fish get trapped in the mud. So this picture is not of people planting. They're actually fishing. They're getting fish out of the mud. Sometimes the mud is way steep, um, a couple inches deep, so like that. So there's still a little tiny fish in there, and then some of it's way steep. And so when I was out there at the waist deep mud fishing, they're reaching in there, pulling up garbage and plants and all kinds of stuff. And then once in a while, just like this next photo, they pull out a fish. It's super, super messy <laughs> and complicated. And if you go up to where they're doing this, if you look over the field where that is, you don't see any fish. But... And so you could go through life and look around Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and say, hey, things are pretty good. But the reality is if you get into the mud, you'll realize there's people ready to give their last spiritual breath. And God's looking for people who will go into the mud. And sometimes God has strategically placed you in the mud. You say, why did God put me in this family? They drive me crazy. You know, the ones who are laughing, they might be the person next to you, right? But, but the idea is you thought, and even when you go to a new job or, something, or you relocated or you started something, you, at first you thought, man, I'm here for the gospel. And you start, but then the reality of reaching in that world and how messy it got, it can become discouraging and distracting. The same with the girls at Uton's place. You, you reach into their world, it gets so messy and complicated. There's easier girls to reach because they don't come with all that complication. But the amazing thing is God is stirring up people to go out into the mud. They, they're part in the orchestra. They've been strategically placed. And if that's you, let me encourage you today to keep fishing. Because that improbable coworker, that impossible family member, if we allow God to use us and place us, we're going to reach into that world and we're going to see God orchestrate history for his redemptive opportunity. Keep fishing. Even when it doesn't seem like things are going right. Just like that moment when he went to the cross. But God is orchestrating history for his redemptive opportunity. If I was writing this story of Jesus going to the cross, I would have just said, you know what? The thieves got pardoned. Jesus never went to the cross. But despite the evidence to the contrary on that day, God was orchestrating history. And he is the conductor and we can trust him. You know, Romans 8, 28 through 29 says, and we know that some things, no, all things work for good for those who love him or are called according to his purpose. And see, and that's the same way you and I can be assured that God is orchestrating history for his redemptive purpose. If we read ahead in the score that's being written or look back on the history books, God has been about one thing, that none should perish. That was what he is orchestrating history about. So God's orchestrating history for his redemptive opportunity. The second thing that we notice in this story is that God is orchestrating history for the individual. So here is, you know, think about this. When Jesus went to the cross, do you think he could have died a year later and it would have counted? Like if he had said, hey, you know what? I'm liking the food here on earth. I'm just going to stay another year. He could have, and it still would have died for the millions and billions of people that ever lived, right? He, it would have been an atonement that would have paid for the sin. If he said, hey, I'm going to die the week before, it still would have counted. But think about it. He chose to die on that day. God orchestrated history that day. Why? Because there were those two thieves. 
Think about it. You know, in the midst of millions of people, he chose to die between those two thieves. Verse 32, you know, the two other men, both criminals, came out to be executed. One of them we know, in verse 39, hurls insults at him, says, aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But then the other one says, don't you fear God? We're getting what our deeds deserve. And then he's like, Jesus, hey, remember me. And Jesus is like, you're going to be with me in paradise. I live in a, I've lived in super crowded places. So this next slide is, uh, this is a train. Okay, so if you ever get like complain about the trains around here, if you ride a train commute, it could be worse. But the only advantage, if you, you're on top, it's free. So could try that, probably make the news here. But, um, but the point is, it is super crowded where I am. Go ahead and go to the next slide. This is the largest Muslim gathering in the world in Dhaka, Bangladesh. Will happen um, just happened last month or the month before. Two or three million Muslims will come and pray. And then they all leave at once. And so the, the city we live in was only 10 miles in any direction from here, and we had 15 to 16 million people. So you get into all these numbers, but the reality is when you think of this story of Jesus going on the cross, it shows me that he's orchestrating history for the one, for that individual. It, at Utom's place, you can go to the next slide. When the girls were younger, we, we, uh, we got them all Build-A-Bears. And every single Build-A-Bear is different. And they have different clothes. This is very complicated, by the way, to buy different clothes, to get different Build-A-Bears. If you'll notice, all of them have different uniforms. If there's a frame in the Utom's place, the frame is different for each girl. And we have tried in every possible way to have something different for every single girl. And why do we do that? Because we want to tell them, in this city of millions of people, in this country of hundreds of millions of people, God had his hand on your life. You are special to God. You're unique to God. And so that's the reality. God shows us that he is orchestrating history for the individual. And so we think of the millions in the world. He has that family member in his sights, that individual. He's got that person on the, in the islands in the Indian Ocean that's sitting on the beach right now that's lost without access to the gospel or in the mountains of the Himalayas. He is orchestrating history for the one. Yes, he died for all the sins of the world, but he demonstrated his love for the individual. And that's when you start to think about us and his orchestra, that's what he's going to do. He's going to orchestrate our steps to be part of that plan of reaching those individuals so it won't be by mistake that we're at a restaurant or it won't be my mistake that we get a, a specific phone call and we go oh this is gonna be a tough one but God has strategically placed us there for the one so God's not or only orchestrating history for the individual he is you know he is well first of all he's orchestrating our history for our lives to be at the right place at the right time to share the hope that we have. So as we talk about these individuals, you know what? The reality is some will reject. Some will accept. Think, look at Jesus. He was like 50-50. He's at the cross. Only one person accepts the other. And he was Jesus. And so as you do your five for five this week, don't be discouraged if you get two out of five that come or those kind of things. Because that's not our job. But our job is to go and to, and to invite people to know the hope that we have. Some will accept, some will reject, but our job is to look to the conductor and wait for our time to play. Some of the time we are waiting on his timing. You know, there's, it is about timing. So he might, you might be, have been waiting a hundred measures and then all of a sudden at work, someone's going through a crisis and God's gonna go, now's the time to reach out to them in love and share the testimony of what you, when you went through a similar thing. And, and now is the time, you know, and so as we look, fix our eyes on the conductor, we're going to see him orchestrate our lives. The third thing that we notice in these stories, the story is that God is orchestrating history through extraordinary measures. So not only for his redemptive opportunity and for the individual, but through extraordinary measures. First of all, in the broad scope, think about Jesus dying for the sins of the world. This is a pretty amazing thing he did. You know, he's up in heaven. He looks down at this earth, this little marble with little dots on it like bacteria called humans. 
and he says they're, you know, like they're the ones that are disobeying us, causing all these problems. Like, I think I would have went like, boop, let's start over on Mars. You know, let's just start over. But he, he goes through extraordinary measures to become like us, the bacteria, you know, like come down to earth. That kind of coming and being like us, going, living on a, a sinless life, being betrayed by a friend, beaten, mocked. He could have ended it all at any time. He could have just said, I'm done. Yet those extraordinary measures led him to come to die for everyone. But then when you start to think about these two individuals, they were forgotten about by society. They were in prison, so they weren't at the feeding of the 5,000. They weren't running into Jesus, walking through town. They have been in prison. They were getting what their deeds deserved. They were inaccessible because they were behind bars. They're, they were undeserving by a lot of standards. You know, and as we look at the world and we say, hey, we love Jesus, every tribe, every nation want to reach the world. We sometimes put like a little list of people, not, we don't write it out, but we'll start like, hey, grandma so-and-so, she'd make a great believer. And then we start to watch the news in a certain people group or a certain religion. We go, ah, they're not so much, to, or they did certain things, you know, and, the, and we start to, well, they're not as deserving, but yet Jesus demonstrated that he would go to extraordinary measures right? Extraordinary measures for, for these people. And as the crescendo of history is going on right now, you, you say, what do you mean by that? Well, more people are proclaiming the gospel today than ever in history. It's going on because there's a crescendo of history. There's a climax that's coming. Jesus is coming soon, and he's going to ask people to do extraordinary things in these last days. As he has demonstrated you know, there was a show on several years ago called uh, Extreme Trucking or something like that. And they would go in South America. You can go to the next slide. And they would take goods from one place to another. And they would go on these, like, harrowing roads. And I remember watching one where they just walked away from the truck. It was, like, so risky. And you're like, I guess you can do that. But so they have this kind of extreme uh, trucking. And, and so I th thought about, like, up in Nepal... We, uh, we, I've, one of the people I go visit, we literally, I turn on these kind of cliffs like a hundred, more than a hundred times to get to them. And they are legally blind. And they are from the U.S. They're legally blind. And yet they go to these remote places which have cliffs that drop off that at any moment you could make a mistake. And why do they do that? Because they're called to do extraordinary things. Because the gospel is that important that they don't say, well, that's the reason that I'm not going to do it. A worker in Bangladesh, she, uh, she just retired at 72. She was in the photo there teaching the girls. She's like a grandma to the kids. So she went to the field when she was widowed. So she, her husband died. She goes after he's widowed. And she goes to Bangladesh, which is extremely hot, and she hates hot temperatures. She hates, she can't have spicy food. She literally gets sick from spicy food. So she goes to a country that that's all they eat is spicy food. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. But what it does start to make sense when you realize God is calling people to do extraordinary things. And so it doesn't matter whether you're a teenager, college student, a senior citizen. In these last days, he's raising up people to say, we're going to go do extraordinary things. The next slide is a picture of a family in Nepal that they were in America working in architecture, building business, and now today they work overseas and using that as their platform to have access to helping people during the earthquake, to helping build different buildings. And at first you might think, well, I didn't realize you could do that in, you know, for missions. But yeah, God's raising up people and their unique gifting, if you go to the next list, we could have the list up there if it's up there. Oh, sports is another one. I'm wearing one of our that's one of the other ways. But all these different kinds of things that people wouldn't normally think. If you work for Holiday Inn Hotels, you could get placed in one of our creative access countries. There's things that we don't normally think. And in these last days, I believe God's going to raise up people to say, hey, I want to have more than just making money. I want to have significance for the kingdom of God. God's calling people to do extraordinary measures in these last days. He's going to call people to do extraordinary measures in their prayer time, to pray like everything depended on it. 
we had a worker that came to Bangladesh. She was in the 1950s. Her name was Elsie. And she came in the 50s, and then she got kicked out of Bangladesh for getting married. So it was like a rule with our organization, like you can't get married. And so she got married to another American. So she gets kicked out. So she visits in 2000. So now she's now not in her 20s anymore. Now she's in her 70s. She has a walker. She goes to the village where she served, and a person taps on the window and says, you're Elsie, Brisbane. And, they, and he says, many years ago, there was a kid who was sick in the village, and we called the church, and you came and prayed, and God healed him. And see how, think about what it took for God to orchestrate that. I mean, here's a country of 160 million people. I can't even find my wife in our own building when we lived there. You know, like, so, but he orchestrated history. Why? To show that when we pray, God will show up. God's calling people to do extraordinary measures in their giving, investing in the kingdom of God. So my first Speed the Light car was paid $38,000 by one youth group of less than 20 youth. One of the kids gave up his college funds. Today, that youth is a missionary. Why? Because God's calling people to do extraordinary things in their giving. God challenges Lori and I in our giving. You say, wait a minute, aren't you like a missions? You're in missions, so you're like missions exempt. You're like tax exempt. Like, no. We get a salary for being a worker overseas, and we have, and we have to say, hey, God, what are we going to do? When it comes to this faith promise that we're going to be talking about at the end, that's what Lori and I do. We take a faith promise each year, and we say, God, what do you want to do as we invest in things for the kingdom of God? Because everything else is temporary. Think about it. I went, to, I went down to Delaware last week and bought a new phone because they have tax-free, you know? And uh, no one in that store was saying, I want an Apple One, I mean, iPhone One. Could you get me an iPhone 1? No, right? They're talking 7, 8, 10, whatever the number, or X or whatever. Because everything we invest in this world is temporary. And then a few years from now, it won't matter. You know, do you even remember what you got for Christmas last year? Like all those things are temporary. But when we invest in God, it changes history. And so as a husband and wife, we say, okay. And the way we figure out our card, we, what we start to do is we say, what can we do? So we just look at it in a practical way and say, this is what we do for our tithe. So we already give to our tithe. This is not separate. It's not the same thing. We give tithe to our church. Then we say, all right. Then we say, God, what do you, you know, we work out our, our uh, budget. And we say, okay, this much more we can give to missions. And so we figure that out. And that's where we start. But then the second part is then God challenges, okay, what can we give up that might add to that amount? And uh, I, I have this dream one day of going to heaven and there's going to be a Coca-Cola angel because there's no Pepsi angels in heaven. And, uh, but it's going to, I don't drink coffee, so it's going to list all the Diet Cokes I drank my entire life. You know, like Dorney Park, $12, you know. And uh, go down, and then this morning, throw on the Arizona Arnold Palmers, which are my favorite, you know, put those down there. And all those drinks that I bought my entire life, they will never come close to what we gave to missions. Because how could I say it was more important to drink Coke than it was to reach the world? And so... Each of us, it'll be different. It'll be a different challenge. But one of the times when we talked about this, what are we going to give up? We're down in Baltimore, and one of the pastors there that's working on a revitalization of inner city church, and he said, I just need people to support me for two years, and that'll get the church on its feet. And I remember I was going to buy a computer at that time. I was going to get my new MacBook. And, and I remember God just saying, you can give that up right now. You know, this time, you can get that later. No problem. And that can go into the kingdom of God. But again, those two categories are just like, figure it out, give up something, give up a Starbucks, whatever, and come up with something. But then the part about this faith promise, the faith part is the part that's the scary part for my wife and I. Because then we come to that point, the third part of our coming to an, a, an understanding what we're going to do for the year is that there's this place where you can't figure it out, you can't give up enough, and then you say, God, what are you going to, what do you want us to believe you for this year to impact the world that doesn't make sense, doesn't have, we can't calculate it, we can't figure it out. And I remember one year we were at Christmas time, we always give a gift to Jesus at Christmas, like under the tree. He doesn't actually come to our house, but you know, we have a tree, we have a gift because we're like, hey, this Christmas we'll give to this ministry, whatever it is, Teen Challenge, whatever, because that's our gift to Jesus. And it's usually our most expensive gift because it's like, hey, it's his birthday. But I remember one year, God challenged me and said, 
How about you give a gift to Jesus that's equal to all your presents that you bought? And then you're like, oh, now that, I can't calculate that. I can't give up enough for that. And I was like, okay, that's, that's going to be our faith promise this year. We're going to step out. And before the end of January, God had provided that in a miraculous way. Why? Because, again, it's about what he's about. He's about orchestrating history. He can orchestrate funds to flow through us as we step out in faith, and then we'll see him impact the world. For me, it's about participation. So we want our kids from the youngest age to say, hey, what do you want to do through me? So that it's about participation. It's never really about amount. Each of us will be different amounts, different things. Our story for these three categories will be different. But the fact is God needs each one of us to do, go to extraordinary measures as he is coming soon. God's also orchestrating measures, going, going through extraordinary measures when it comes to going. There's people that God is calling to go. When, uh, when uh, my son was about nine years old here in America for furlough, he said, uh, he came home, he said, I think God's calling me to this very extreme country, and uh, I think I'm going to die there. And my wife's like, well, I think everybody dies. He goes, no, like in the Bible. And so he's like, and he's usually our joker. So you're like waiting for the punchline. And, and, and what do you think we did? We said, well, maybe, Jared, why don't you go to Bangladesh where it's safe? You know, and, uh, and think about it. It might be easy for us to say, hey, I'll go wherever you want me to go. But what about our kids? What about our grandkids? The reality is the gospel is that important. And I'm not saying my son is called or not called to that specific country, but the fact is, where is my posture when it comes to that to say, God, whatever you ask me to do, whatever you ask my kids to do, whatever you ask my grandkids to do, I'm willing to do it. It's sometimes easier for us, but it's tough to sometimes say it's okay for others to go that are close to us. This message is that necessary to the world. Are we willing to go to extraordinary measures so that people will hear the gospel. So God is orchestrating history through, for his redemptive opportunity. He's orchestrating history for the individual. He's orchestrating history through extraordinary measures. And then the last thing we know is that God is orchestrating history through people. Think about it. Jesus' example to us is that he went in person to the cross. To these two. He didn't get a, like a big TV like this and put it on the cross in the middle, and like have a YouTube channel for the two thieves. He didn't send a tweet to the cross, you know. He went in person, and his method his, from that moment on has always been my man, my woman, my teenager, my kid, my adult that's going to go into all the world and share this gospel. He's orchestrating history through people. And we each have a part to play. What happens, though, is we look at the orchestra, and so we got this, we got the soloists up there, and we look at them like, oh, that's the pastor. You know, he's the most important, or the worship team. And, and the reality is God needs each one of us to play our part. And he needs each one of us to play our instrument. But having an instrument doesn't really qualify us. You know, so I have, I learned how to play the saxophone, and, uh, and I was in junior high, in New Jersey, I'm from Sparta, New Jersey, up the northwest part of New Jersey. Uh, there's Christians there, by the way. Uh, and uh, so we have the, uh, we, I'm in the junior high band. I have not practiced. So I have not, I don't know how to play the piece. And we're getting ready for the concert in the gym. And so I have this brilliant idea. All I'm going to do is move my fingers. Okay, no air, nothing. Just move my, they're moving their fingers. I'm moving my fingers. You know, that kind of thing. And so I'm sure my parents, we, you know, back then it was like the VHS cameras. I'm sure they came up to me after videoing the whole thing. We heard you above everybody. We're so glad we invested in that instrument. It was probably, but the point was, though, is I was not playing. <laughs> and you know what? We laugh, but how many Christians come to church on Sunday? They bring their instrument. And they just move their fingers, and then the rest of the week, nothing happens. There's no, nothing happening. So it's not enough just to say we're followers of Christ. We have an instrument to play. And just like when I was in junior high, it was scary. Finally, in 
high school band I actually was playing. Because uh, there comes that point where you get past the fear, you get past the thing and say, you know what? I'm going to play. God's orchestrating my steps. You recognize not only the responsibility, but the opportunity. And he's pointing, he's okay, now's the time to play. It might be scary, but let's do it. God is orchestrating history through people. There's a crescendo of history that's going on, and God is orchestrating our steps. And so it's not he's going to work through those people. He's going to work through each one of us. And the enemy wants to do everything he can to kind of discourage us and distract us and just kind of sideline us and say, no, he doesn't need me. Well, I'm encouraging you today, look to the conductor. If you've been, you know, I think we're going to put the next, is it the next, uh, yeah. You know, when you look at where have you, where have you been at when you think about this, what we've been talking about today? Have you been in that place where you've, it's been hard to realize God's orchestrating history for his redemptive opportunity? Things have been difficult. It's been a struggle with trying to reach your family. It's been tough in the workplace, the environment. You're like, some of you are neck deep in the mud, and you've just been discouraged. Well, today, God wants you to look to the conductor with that anticipation that he's going to orchestrate history for his redemptive opportunity. That's what drives me to keep doing what I'm going to do. He's going to do that for that little kid sitting in the Indian Ocean right now or that old man that's sitting on the top of a mountain or that young person sitting in a mega city that's sitting there hopeless, ready to give their last spiritual breath, and God's going to orchestrate history for someone to reach into the mud of their life, and we're going to see that catch come in. What about the individual? You know, sometimes we can get into all the numbers. Well, this many people in Pennsylvania or this many people in America or the world are lost, but this week as you lead up to Easter and that five for five, he's going to start putting a face that's the one I want you to believe for. That impossible person, that's the one I want you to ask. <laughs> that neighbor that across the street, that one, yes, that's who. And I want you to start to think of it not in numbers, but it's in names and faces. Think about how many of us that became believers, we became believers because someone prayed for us by name. That individuality of it. They didn't just pray for numbers. They prayed for us by name, and God transformed us. And then he might be challenging you today to go to extraordinary measures. That he's saying, okay, from now until I come, I need you to be praying more than ever before. I need you to be investing like never before. And then I need you to, to, to maybe go. And we say, come, come join what God's doing. So it might mean coming all the way to the other side of the world, like Nepal or, or Sri Lanka or Bangladesh, that kind of thing. But it could just mean I need you to go to the grocery store. You know, I need you to answer that call that's going to take an hour to talk to them. Because they might be ready to give their last spiritual breath. And I'm going to orchestrate things. And I'm going to ask you to go to extraordinary measures to reach out to people that are, that are not there. They're, they seem sometimes undeserving. They're inaccessible. And I'm going to ask you to go to extraordinary measures to be my representative. And then maybe God's challenged you about yourself and your instrument. You've thought it, well, hey, that's somebody else's responsibility, somebody else's job. And today God's just been challenging you that your seat in his orchestra is strategic. Your, what you play, whether it even just seems like only two notes, it's critical as this resemptive symphony goes on. Let's pray. Just ask the Lord right now. Just say, hey, God, where am I at in your orchestra? Where am I at? To say, God, here's where I'm at right now. And you're, you know, just look to the conductor and just say, hey, where am I at? I've been, have I just been moving my fingers? Lord, give me the courage to play. Have I forgotten about the faces of the lost, the names of the lost, and that have been dying without the access to the gospel and Today, you're going to just impassion me again for those that need to hear. Just take a moment, just with, between you and the Lord, just say, "Here, God, here's where I'm at. Help me. Help me to go to those extraordinary measures you've been birthing in my heart. Help me.
to do exactly what you're asking me to do. Lord, you see each one of us. We are your vessels. We're your tools. We're just mere clay. But we're, we agree we're going to be your instruments. And in these last days, as the crescendo of history is going on, Lord, I pray that, God, you would use each one in this room, that you would give them eyes to see beyond the physical realities to a reality that you are orchestrating history for your redemptive opportunity. Lord, I pray that we would have testimonies of those people as you orchestrate the steps of the people in this room to interact with people on the highways and the byways and the restaurants and the workplaces and the schools. You orchestrate their lives so that they can be with that individual, just like you were there between those two thieves. And yes, some will reject, some will accept, but that keep them driven to keep letting you orchestrate their steps. Lord, for that one that you're challenging to go to extraordinary measures in prayer, as the enemy will come to distract and say, hey, it's not going to be really effective, it's not going to work, let them pray and continue to pray like never before. For those, God, that you're challenging to invest and say, I want to change history, Lord, I pray that you would let them be a vessel. You just flow through and do amazing things in this next year. And then, Lord, for those that you're going to call to go, And you've already been stirring. Maybe it was five years ago. Maybe it was 10 years ago. Maybe it was just this week you've been stirring them and they're looking today and you're cueing them in and saying, now's the time to take that next step, Lord. Give them the courage to do that. Lord, I pray, Lord, for this church. I don't know all the history of what brought this church into existence, but I'm pretty sure it was about that none should perish. And I pray that all the history books that were written to this day for this church, they'll just pale in comparison as we each pick up our instrument and go where God's sending us to do. Go, being your hands, your feet, and your mouthpieces. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So when you came in today on your seat, there was a brochure about faith promise giving and explaining that more in depth. It also has a faith promise giving card on the back. It has some questions you might be asking. And what is a faith promise? Well, a faith promise is not your tithe or a portion of your tithe. That's the first part that comes to God. But this is a, above and beyond that. And this is what my wife and I do. We take us, you know, we say to God, hey, what do you want to do this year through us in giving for missions? And so we do those three steps. And uh, why do people do this? Well, it's for us to kind of have that moment with God, but then also for the church to be able to plan to say, hey, as our people in our church are believing God that he's going to supply this, then we can project how we're going to uh, impact the world. And so for me, I would encourage you to have, you know, your kids are not here today, but I'd have them after, you know, talk to them and say, hey, what do you want to do this year? Uh, my my uh, son is going on a mission trip this summer to three countries, and he does Rubik's Cube speed cubing. And uh, he's at down to like nine seconds. He can solve a Rubik's Cube. So he goes and does that. But he, when he goes on his trip, he's going to teach like 32 street kids how to do Rubik's Cubes. So one of the fundraisers he has is some of the kids are raising money for the Rubik's Cubes, like $3 each. And so, again, that participation in the Great Commission and that we all participate. So it's never really about the amount. It's about participation, that a church has 100% participation and that we don't again say well i don't need to do that that's for someone else in the symphony well no every part every one of us can take those steps and then say god what we're going to do and so the way it works is you fill out a weekly faith promise if that's how you work you say i want to i'm going to do it every month uh, or every week or i'm going to believe god each month to provide and so if you would take this moment right now and just uh between you and the lord just say hey what am i going to believe god for in the next 12 months and then next year you revisit again. And then you also have those testimonies like, wow, I stepped out in faith and God provided. It was amazing. And then you just, you just, that spurs your faith. And then the next year, that's what happens with us. We're just like, oh, wow, God did that. He's going to do it again. And it becomes exciting because if you think about it, it's what he's about. And if he's about orchestrating history for all redemptive opportunity, he's going to orchestrate finances to make it happen. So if you just take a moment, get a pen out. Fill this out. You fill out your information here, the amount, and in a moment, the ushers are going to come and take that, uh, take, collect these 
and they'll make a tally of them. You tear off this last portion where you put in your amount. You can put in your Bible as a reminder of what uh, God's asking you to, challenging you to give each week or each month over the next uh, year. All right, so go ahead and take a moment to fill those out. As you're filling those out, if you got any questions, uh, we can, we can, uh, could be about missions or whatever, but if you got a question, I can answer that while people are filling these out.